to talk about uh, wildfire and debris flow hazards. Um, Professor Keller is an expert on geomorphology, especially with regard to earthquake reduction and prevention. He also has a big interest in fluvio geomorphology. Uh, he studied development of channels and streams and the controls on where pools and riffles develop and how they change with time. He's had a, a big role in uh, researching wildfire and the recurrence of high magnitude flood deposits and debris flow deposits. Uh, Professor Keller currently works at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he got a PhD from Purdue University. He's been at UCSB since 1976. Right. So thanks so much, sure. Professor Keller. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, can, can you guys hear me okay? Pretty small room. I guess this mic uh, works. Okay, and thinking about this, I'm uh, interested in planning, and I'm a neo McCartian kind of approach to planning of letting the site kind of pick itself. And I've also had a, a strong interest in uh, natural hazards. In 2000, in fact, some, one of my grad students pointed out I wrote a paper in which I said the next big one in Santa Barbara probably won't be an earthquake, but a massive amount of boulders coming from one of our streams. I never thought that would come pass in my lifetime. Uh, but, of course, it has, and so it's something to uh, think about. First thing to recognize is that these events are rare, really rare. Uh, if you don't have a fire, the chances are probably one in a few hundred to one in a few thousand in any one year. If you have the fire, you can reduce that by ten times, one in a few hundred, depending on the rainstorm that you get. We're putting together, or have put together, a rather large research team at UCSB to uh, study this debris flow, the aftermath, and even the social impacts, which we're starting a study on now to mine uh, social media and, and uh, 911 calls and interviewing people in the field. Because everybody has an idea about what people thought, what they knew, uh, but we have no data to support that. Just like everybody says, well, there's enough debris up there to produce this thing again maybe two or three times. I said, well, where'd you get your, de your data? Well, I read it in the news press. <laughs> I have nothing against the news press, okay? Uh, but science doesn't uh, quote things from papers. They quote us, generally. Uh, and so we have teams out there now measuring the boulders upstream in the production area. And we'll be measuring the volume of the flow, and we'll be able to get that ratio. But my guess is uh, an awful lot of the boulders came down. It takes a long time to build up a huge amount of boulders uh, that can then be mobilized as a moving dam of rock. It has about the same density as the rock, so that's why the big boulders float on top. Anyway, uh, Pris, uh, Professor Kristen Morell, a new faculty member, will be taking over in about a month because I'm on sabbatical. I'll be around, but I'll be on leave for a few months. And she's very good, and she's really good at GIS, and she'll be working with the uh, LIDAR and, and helping uh, uh, supervise some of our research team. Professor Tom Dunn is one of the world's experts in the physics of debris flows, and he's out there almost every day. He's retiring the end of this quarter, so he can do more research, and we've got about eight undergraduates and graduate students working with GPS to map accumulations of boulders. We're particularly paying attention to where the flow came from, okay? And so uh, we want to know what physically actually happened. He does. I'm more interested in the general hazard and mitigation. And then uh, Professor Chen Ji is a seismologist. After talking to some people up there, it became clear to me anyway that uh, this flow probably left a seismic signal and seismographs that we use to measure earthquakes. So he's doing that, and we, in fact, do see one. And so why would you care about that, OK? Well, there's a lot of uh, speculation. When did the debris start? When did it end? When did it peak? The seismograph will give us duration and a better idea than 911 calls and other things, which may have been delayed, and we'll have a different set of timing. How quickly after the burst of rainfall did this flow happen? The literature says it should happen in five to 10 minutes. So I'd like to, that's something we'll be checking. And, uh, and so uh, Professor G. Chen Ji will be doing that. Larry Garoa is a local uh, consultant, one of my PhD students who worked on his PhD in Montecito and Santa Barbara. 
mapping most of the debris flow fans. And, uh, and so he'll be continuing on with that, and we want to absolutely date every debris flow we can find <laughs> using exposure dating of uh, uh, cosmogenic isotopes, radiocarbon, and a few other methods. And why would we want to do that? Well, the reason is we want to know in any one canyon or place how often these things happen. The only way to really know that is to guess or actually date them so we can say, well, in this canyon, we saw debris flows come out, you know, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 25,000 years ago. We have fans in Montecito up to 125,000 years old made of debris flows. The Rocky Nook flow, which I studied years ago, is about 1,000 years old. And a repeat of that event would be much more destructive than this one was because it's likely to go right into Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara City itself is built on an alluvial fan, and there's many, many large boulders from the mission on down. If you look through the yards of people, you'll see them everywhere, and all the walls made of rock. And so it's a, it's a potential hazard. Goleta has a similar hazard, but we're going to map the fans there and try to date when those flows came out as well. So that's kind of our one thing I'll, I'm working on with Larry. Joan Florsham, another one of my PhD students, works on dry rabble and changes in sediment delivery following wildfire, and she'll be helping with that. Paula Lucio is a current PhD student, and uh, he's kind of spearheading and teaching the students to use G modern GPS research methods. And he's doing his thesis actually on coastal erosion from approximately Santa Barbara Point to um, oh, Colo Point in that general area. Uh, but he knows very well how to use LIDAR and, and, and things like that. We did lose our drone, unfortunately. Somehow got away from it. Okay, uh, I think it failed more than program. Who knows? Maybe we'll find it. It's in somebody's backyard in Montes. Erica Gotu is a PhD student from Brazil. She's studying landslides in Brazil. And part of her work is the social impacts. And so she'll be working with me and some other people, maybe in environmental studies, to try to better understand what people were thinking, what they knew, what motivated them to uh, uh, evacuate or not. There's lots of speculation on that. We tend to do some surveys and try to find out uh, a little more precisely. So that's kind of our research team. This is 101, of course. I, didn't, I took out a lot of the gruesome pictures of the debris flow because I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with that. But anyway, debris flows uh, are in the mountains. Okay? That's almost always the generation point. Down. Have a wet. Flows following the main mass. Boulders, big lines on them that tells you the flow. So uh, there are three general stages of these things. California wildfire is almost always necessary in the chaparral. Uh, kind of base soils, loose vegetation, ocean rates. Then it seems we need intense precipitation. By intent, uh, the storm that generated this was, was really a five minute burst for the most part. But we're still working on the radar, the rainfall, to see what it was. And we think the flow started just within minutes following that. Probably like these kind of storms. Maybe I pushed it. Can you hear now better? Did you all want me to start over again? You all heard it, right? Okay. Okay, so um, stage three, or stage three, uh, the intense precipitation. Uh, so to load these things up together to produce a debris flow, it's kind of a rare event. So even if you're generous and say it's been 30, 40 years since a fire and there's a one chance in 10 that you'll burn, or one in 20, that's, uh, you know, one tenth. If you need a 200-year storm, that's then one chance in 2,000 that you load those two things together in close proximity. 
It won't work if you get the rain first, then the fire. You've got to get it in the right order. And so if we see another high intense rainstorm, we could see mud flows. We could see some debris flows. But again, the chances are not great, fortunately. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be prepared. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure we are now. So the debris flow sources are on steep slopes above the foot of the mountains, which we call the Piedmont. The debris flow deposits on debris flow fans. So that's a term to become sort of familiar with. Uh, debris flow fans, which is the type of an alluvial fan that has an apex and then spreads out. Alluvial fans and debris flow fans are difficult to deal with and plan for. Whole publications have been written about how to manage flooding on, the, on, uh, on fans. Because it, you know it comes out of one little point of a basin, right? Up there somewhere. But then it can go anywhere, <laughs> OK? And over time, it migrates back and forth. That's why it's a fan. And so just because it came out one place, one flow, doesn't mean the next time it will. And there could be lots of sheet flooding as well. This is a problem in Santa Barbara and any, any real alluvial fan environment. Makes, just makes planning more difficult in terms of how to deal with the, with the flooding and debris flows. Debris flows need a source of boulders, okay? And that takes a while to accumulate. If you're up in the sandstone units, they got to roll down, get in the channel. They aren't all rolling down in that five minutes, believe me. They're already there. If you ever walked up Cold Springs or some of these trails before the event, they were chuck full of nice boulders. And everybody likes to boulder hop along the trails. And they're just full. If you want to see one, go up, to, go up to Rattlesnake Creek. It's pretty prime right now with boulders. But we haven't had a debris flow there probably in a 1,000 years more. So um, you need the source of boulders. And, uh, but more importantly, you need a fine sediment or mud. Because when, when it runs off, what comes down is the fine sediments from our shale units, in our case. Fills all the holes in the boulders, raises the pore pressures, increases the mass. And, and changes the viscosity, and then on the right slope and right condition, it takes off as a, as a debris flow, moving 20 or 30 miles an hour. So it's very fast flow. And behind it, after the boulders are mostly cleared out, and that's why I think they're cleared out, you get this mud tail. Okay? And then, uh, then the thing stops, and the boulders, when it gets on lower ground, eventually the friction and so forth gets so great. It sounds like machine guns going off or a railroad train going by. You can hear them, and it shakes the houses. When those big boulders stop, then there's still mud from the back. It'll, I think I'm trying to work out what happens, but my vision is it goes around the sides and over the top and makes mud flows in front and the side. And so, so there's a lot of mud. Without the mud, you can't get the flow. You can't just move a pile of boulders by themselves. So that's something we're working on. They have a unit weight. It means, you know, like, uh, say, 150 pounds. That's, uh, you know, water 68 about 68 pounds per cubic foot, so it's roughly two and a half times that or so. And the unit weight of the mud's about 120, so they're pretty close, right? Which means that these boulders, given the viscosity and the velocity, will bob along like corks on the top of the flow. They move to the front, sometimes to the side, forming debris flow levees. You can see many great examples of these in Rattlesnake, in Rocky Nook Park debris flow levees. And I have them up where I live, too. I live on a debris flow, too. A lot of people live on debris flows. OK, so, um, so the boulders are carried near the surface and the front and sides. Boulders bob along like corks, more or less. If you've ever seen a debris flow video on YouTube, you can see that. Uh, one of the problems with debris flows is that they, if there's an obstruction, like a bridge, uh, it can pipe, and as it culverts to back up and flood, then they'll flow over the top of it, sometimes by 20, 30 feet. And so that makes a surge. Also, if it goes around a bend, may not, because it's going so fast, it's elevated up, it slops over, may go on the inside and change path position, which is probably what happened at 101. So, um, so, they, so our own structures can, can cause a lot of problems. And most of our bridges are way undersized for these kind of things, and our culverts, for that matter, too. And they, many of them just became plugged up. And uh, they get plugged up with a couple big boulders, and then the, the mud and the flow just goes over the road and then spreads out down below because it goes to the side and makes all the devastation we saw in these areas where the flow was wide and wiped out a lot of houses. 
you want to maintain the flow in the channel, you need bigger channels and bigger bridges and bigger culverts, way bigger. Okay? Uh, so you need, we should learn from this event if we want to plan for this, but again, it's a rare event. So when you come to planning, how much planning do we do for an earthquake that occurs every 300 years? Well, it turns out a lot, right? Because we have all kinds of building codes and things. So it's that kind of thing that we're looking at. And so that's kind of interesting. The, I made this graph about 20 years ago when I was studying. Uh, this is not. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Uh, when I was studying instability in basins and watershed burns and uh, random flood events. And I was working in Ventura, a tributary that probably had a debris flow this time too. No, Ventura did have some debris, debris flows along uh, Ventura River, but in places nobody lived, so nobody reported them. So we'll go back and study those at our leisure, I hope. But uh, so if you have watershed burns that are fairly regular, our burn frequency is 30 to 50 years. Sometimes we repress the fire and it could go longer, 50, 60 years. Then we have random flood events. So if I have a big bowl of marbles here with 100 marbles in it, 99 are white and one is red. If I want the 100-year flood, I've got to pull that red one. Okay? Uh, so, but, but it turns out that in, over a period of 100 years uh, or so, uh, the probability of that, it's not a regular returning. You know, it's, it's based on a probability. And so it changes with the probability analysis. And you can work out what's the chance of a 100-year flood in a 10-year period, 20 years, 30, 40. But occasionally, they line up. Okay? But that's still not enough to produce our flow. Okay? And so, uh, even if you have a tense precipitation, wildfire, this basin instability is a long wave function of probably hundreds of years, which takes for these boulders to accumulate in the creek so you have the ammunition for the debris flow. If all those things line up in perfect space, then so you get a debris flow, okay, a big one. Now, having said that, after every uh, wildfire, this is not working very good, you, to you warned me. After every uh, wildfire, uh, there are many, many debris flows. So you get many, many debris flows. After the Painted Cave fire and so I saw hundreds of debris flows. But most of them are little. For, every, for our big debris flow on the Piedmont, there are thousands of debris flows up in the basin. But they're small. And these are what delivered the mud and the fine sediment, OK, off like the Cozy Dale Shale. Somebody had a really poetic naming system then. And uh, above that's the Hunkow Shale. And that's all these rills you see up there. That's what delivered the fine sediment, which is so necessary for the flow. Now, those are all, what's happening up there is natural. We can't control that, OK? Uh, I mean, you could have controlled burns. But I think they're more dangerous than just kind of waiting around, because controlled burns often get out of control is a problem. So, so it's going to burn every 30 to 50 years. If we get a big, really high magnitude storm, intense storm after that, with half an inch in five minutes, or maybe three quarters of an inch in an hour, or an inch, in, then we may see a debris flow. A bigger one, we're going to see a lot of little ones, but they probably, a lot of them probably won't even get into the urban part. So they're pretty rare events. What you do see is these little Fs. And these are flushing events. Every wildfire I've seen, even with moderate rainfall, after the event, you get a movement of this fine sediment. It may not be a mud flow. It may be almost like a river tramp. But you get a, it can fill the whole stream with, with gravel, little gravel. And that little gravel uh, is washed out usually in the next flow. It's a flushing of sediment, which I think is important for streams, actually. You know, we have fish living in these streams, you know, like steelhead trout and things, and uh, other fish. And, and they need spawning gravels. This is one way spawning gravels can make it to the stream. Uh, barring that, eventually all the finer stuff that would be great for spawning is moved out, and then you've lost your productivity from the ecosystem. So these are kind of important. But you see those almost, I put one after every fire, and we see those quite frequently. Well, the, the uh, Thomas Fire in Romero Canyon and other places was very, was intense. I d we don't know how intense it was. Uh, it looked intense. Okay, it was lots of flames. But there is a fire intensity scale. 
And sometimes if the fire is intense enough, the soils may become hydrophobic, where the particles of soils are locked with waxy material. We haven't seen any evidence for that, by the way, yet. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. Every fire doesn't do this. But the slopes are so steep, when the vegetation's gone, you still get this flushing of sediment. So we're looking into that, uh, uh, the hydrophobic, but we know the flow happened. This is just a graph of the burn area. Pretty easy to see the boundaries. And uh, the fire response was, was excellent. They held the fire from entering most of the areas of Montecito and saved a lot. I was really worried when that fire started that Montecito disappear off the face of the earth from the fire. Because Montecito, Montecito's loaded with fuel and some of the worst trees that you can possibly have in a fire are eucalyptus. And if I had anything to do with planting, I'd get rid of every eucalyptus tree in the Santa Barbara area. Butterflies are not. They, they, butterflies can go in oak trees and other trees. These trees explode. If you read the, the Australian literature, I read one paper that said, Big Bold, never build a house near a eucalyptus tree. And uh, I noticed after I published some of that in the news press a few years ago, the fire department took out their eucalyptus trees around them. These things can go up like a firebrand. And when they're fire adapted, as is our chaparral. And if you look at a eucalyptus tree, you notice the bark all hanging down? That's an adaptive feature probably to invite fire, because without fire, they can't reproduce. And when they, when they get hot, they just shoot out things. They can shoot out things hundreds of yards and start spot fires. So uh, if I were in the planning commission, in our reviewing project, I'd say get rid of the eucalyptus tree. San, uh, Montecito's still a fire trap waiting to happen in many, many places. That's not here to talk about fires, except to initiate debris flows. So we had all this rainfall, as much as, uh, you know, four or five inches. It just happened to center right over Montecito, uh, which was unfortunate, but it would have been unfortunate for anybody else who had been down closer to Ventura or up in Ojai. Uh, they might have faced a similar type uh, hazard and events that we did. But a half an inch in five minutes is a very unusual rainfall. These are the rain gauge stations and some of the rain gauge from Dalton Tunnel and another one there. I can't know exactly where it is, but this is the seismic date. I should just show it to you. We have two seismic stations that seem to be close enough to report this frequency. Uh, houses shook. People told me they could feel the ground shaking like an earthquake. That, that kind of influenced me to talk to our seismologist. This, and so we have a station at, the, at what's called SBCC, but it's really at the museum. And there's another one out in this area. And you can see, okay, now we're still studying these. We're going back several days and forward several days, looking at other rainstorms. Stream flow can initiate little seismic things, but this is a pretty big signal. So I'm not running by this, but we're exploring it as we speak. So, uh, but it's kind of interesting. So we had a lot of rainfall. The US Geological Survey did a great job <clears throat> before the event by predicting which basins were likely to have a debris flow if you had a threshold rainfall event, and they had it, I think, at, uh, let's see, 24 millimeters an hour, 15 minute rainfall duration. 24 millimeters, 2.5, about an inch, right? <laughs> okay. So the ones in red are the ones that had the highest probability, and these are the ones that pretty much had the debris flows in Montecito and where the rain was. Uh, but if you look at the whole fire area, there were hundreds of basins that met these requirements, but they didn't necessarily have the threshold rainfall. And 60 to 80 percent probability is pretty high, but it's not certainty by any sense, right? So, so that's something to think about, too. So this is a good map. They were somewhat criticized because, well, you know, they didn't predict where the flows would go. That was not their charge, nor what they were attempting to do, okay? Their science project, they didn't know a debris flow was coming necessarily, was to see what conditions were likely to generate flows. And then, uh, and so I, a lot of people didn't see anything down here, so I guess they stopped all the flows were going to stop at 192, because that's eventually where the evacuation line was, same as the fire. One thing the county really needs to do, in my estimation, hire more geologists. You used to have a really good county and city geologist. We have a great one in North County. 
But, you know, any geologist in a geology one course could have told you that those flows were going to come down those streams. That's not, that's like 101 of planning. McCard says, design with nature. Okay? So, so we made some errors on, on that, I think. That's not saying the people who responded and did all the stuff did a great job, a really great job. I'm so proud of them. They went and risked their lives to save people. But, but they didn't really have training to understand the kind of things we're talking about. And most people in planning, some do, some don't. But I think we need to be more aware of our environment. We live in a very active, tectonic, intensive, rainfall, fire, <laughs> a prone area, and we need to pay attention to these things. And the only way to do that, one way to do it, is to make sure we have some good geologic staff. We do have some good. I'm not saying we don't. But, I, you know, if I were to tell the county, and I'd say, hire Larry Garoa, who did his PhD in this area, and, uh, or somebody like him that really knows and can work with people on planning. He's already helped, and I've helped some people up there. Are you safe or are you not safe? There are lots of places in Montecito that are safe from other debris flows. But you need to know the elevation. There's also some faults that run through Montecito that have uplifted the land and made scarps that the flows can't get over. There are some places where the stream banks are 25, 30 feet high. It's unlikely they'll get over. So there's a, some areas in there that are, that are reasonably safe, but uh, you can't probably base evacuations on a micro scale like that. But if you could, uh, then, then we could be uh, more adept. The bigger danger parts are the lower parts, where it's more likely to shift. Okay? And we saw that near Casa Dorinda. What happened up at San Ysidro Road was the culverts became became plugged in the bridge and flopped up and over and spread out. And, I, and, I, and the other places, we often that happens too. So, uh, but, but again, these flows can go anywhere beyond the apex, anywhere on the fan. And it's very difficult to predict where they're going to go. So again, I want to just emphasize, I'm not criticizing the fire, the county, the flood control. They all did an admirable job. And the county made a great response. But I think we need to learn from this uh, uh, situation and put it in perspective of, of the time framework I'm talking about of rare events, okay? So, anyway, that's my opinion. Anyway, this is at, uh, Rand you've probably seen some of these at Randall Road, uh, where, where, the, where the flow broke out in multiple channels. There was a fire up there, evidently. I don't know what time that fire started. I'd like to know. That's interesting, because... Uh, would pretty much date probably when the flow went by there. We have a few videos. But all you see is whoosh! <laughs> you know, even up in the canyons where people took it, it's going so fast that the range of the camera is like, it's gone. And so it's difficult to get, uh, to get the velocity, which we need to get the viscosity, which we need to understand the physics of these things, which is, again, not my lane, but, but that's what we want to do. It. Houses were buried in these debris flow uh, patches of, of the big boulders, boulder patches, we call them. This was the mass of the debris. Some of the boulders, as you know, were 10, 12, 15 feet high. But again, they can move. If there had been a boulder 50 feet high, it probably could have moved it if it was deep enough flow. It just would have floated down with the rest of them. I've got boulders near my house that are 20, 30 feet high. So, uh, so that, does that can happen. Here's one guy who kind of got fixated on breaking up the big boulders. And uh, we're drilling them, and they were breaking them into pieces. And now they realize the boulders are actually pretty valuable. Most people I talked to on, over the years in Montecito and Santa Barbara loved having these little boulders in their yard because they're so pretty. They provide variety. Uh, but no one knew where they came from or what the process of delivery was, but, but they kind of liked them. Um, and so anyway, they were doing some of this. Uh, this is a map that Larry made 20 years ago of Montecito area shows some of the faults going through and some of the canyons we're talking about, Cold Springs, San Ysidro, Oak, so forth. Uh, Oak Creek that goes by Montecito Union did not have a debris flow. They had a little flushing. Uh, and maybe in the upper portion there were some houses that were damaged by that, maybe. I haven't been up there yet, but down below certainly it, it wasn't much uh, in, term, in terms of that. Uh, but, there's not, but the drainage basin doesn't go very far up into the source area, whereas Cold Springs and San Ysidro, Romero Canyon go well up into the, into the mountains. But these are like Q2, Q2, Q1. As the numbers get smaller, there are more recent debris flows. Usually you see recent flows up near the fronts, 
Uh, we, the oldest flows, we think, in Matasito are about 125,000 years ago. And the youngest is a couple weeks ago, right? So, so we've got this whole range of ages. But we don't have any ages in between, okay? And so right now, that's why we want to map all of these in greater detail, these lobes, and go in there and actually date them. Say, well, oh, this one's 10,000 years, this is 20, this is 30, it's 120, whatever they are. These big debris flows play a big role in our, in our area. Anybody live on the Riviera? Okay, well, you know there's some boulders on top, probably. That's a debris flow. You say, well, how'd I get up there? Well, the debris flow came out of Rattlesnake Canyon on a fan that's up by Schofield. And then in the last 125,000 years, the whole thing's been faulted and folded to form the Riviera. So the Riviera is no older than about 125,000 years. Very young landscape. And so, uh, and that's why the boulders are there, okay? So that's kind of our older uh, fan. 125,000 years ago to geologists is a very special time called the Eemian. It's the last major interglacial. That I mean a lot to you guys, but uh, sea levels were higher than today by about 18 feet. It was warmer than it is today by a fair amount. And since then, the climate's fluctuated other times. So there has been times in the past where climate produced a higher sea level and a warmer environment than we see today naturally. Nobody was burning fossil fuels in. Having said that, we are now seeing climate change at a rate that's thousands of times, in some cases, faster okay, than it was then. So it's the, it's the how rapid climate is changing. How does that change this? Well, fires. We think it'll become more intense. There's some evidence for that. The fire season has grown to almost all year. So one ingredient to this thing is going to become more common. The other ingredient, we think rainfall will become more intense. More drought, but more intense. So you got the other ingredient. So that'll lower, that will give these little greater odds to seeing these kind of things. I don't think it's going to change it a huge amount, but it will change it. I read last week for the first time. Uh, ever, um, they'll be able, we'll be able to take ships fairly regularly, you know, through up north by Greenland and Iceland, and just the Northwest Passage will be right nice and open, and uh, and and some and the sea ice is almost all all gone in the summer, so it's warming up there two or three times as fast as it is here, and it's almost certainly anthropogenic. So we have warming today, and uh, we had some warming uh, uh, again at about a thousand years ago called the uh, medieval warming period. And that was a great time in Europe. That was time of Camelot. People lived longer, had bigger crops. They had May dances. They would sing songs like in the play, the lusty month of May, because they had this wonderful summers, which was followed by the Black Death, unfortunately, in cold times. It wiped out about two thirds of the people. So climate is always changing. But today is changing faster than even then. Huh? Also during that time, I've been reading books about New Mexico and places where, where, the, where the cliff dwelling people just walked away. Out of these beautiful homes, there were big populations, just walked away. And, uh, and, and they walked away because they were in a really long drought, it looks like. So one of the things with warming that we may have is longer droughts. Some of the droughts they had back then, some anthropologists and geologists think were generational, a couple generations long. And they just couldn't maintain their living in those, in those places, even though they were very efficient at using water. And so if you go to Chaco Canyon and those places, it looks like they could just walk back in. They didn't die, they just moved <laughs> to some place that was a little more hospitable for them. So we need to think about climate change. Um, but the big problem here, is alluvial fan flooding. In this case, debris flow fan flooding. That's the problem. So you have debris flows. The upper fan may be uh, mostly boulders with a wet tail up here uh, because it's blocking some of the mud that comes after. Most of the boulders have been cleaned out. And then you have the lower part, which is mud again, because the boulder stops somewhere in here, maybe, and then the mud keeps going. And this might be the historic flow path, like where we have our channels today. But there's no guarantee it won't go there or there. And so that makes planning more difficult. Now, 
with flood control channels, you have a better chance of maintaining the channel you want. Provided you have the bridges that are adequate and the culverts that are adequate. But if they're not and it backs up, you know, you, you're going to see what we saw in lower Montecito. So that's an issue. And the, and the damage was clearly along the drain. It's a little bit in Oak Creek, not much, but all the main damage, lots of it in the lower parts some up around 192 in these creeks. So the, the fire people, again, did a great job. And the first responders thought all of Montecito was destroyed probably when it first happened. Then they quickly realized the damage was centered along the drainages. right? And so uh, had we known about debris fan and, debris and, and uh, uh, flooding and debris flow pass, when we evacuated, these, these areas could well have been evacuated just along those, those paths, and probably most of the deaths would have been avoided. But we didn't know, okay? We just didn't know. So when I gave a talk at the Faulkner Gallery, there were like hundreds of people showed up because they were just confused. What happened? You know, almost in a daze, you know? Uh, and they'd ask me, well, were you surprised? Absolutely, I was surprised. Did you expect it? Absolutely, I expected it at some time but we can't tell you when the next one will be, just like with earthquake prediction. We can predict after fire which basins are more likely to produce these things, but we don't have a crystal ball on the rainfall, okay? Or how many, we need to monitor better the boulders up there. I keep hearing these, how many boulders are up there? I don't think anybody really knows. Uh, we're measuring them. The US Geological Survey may have measured them too, but uh, we're trying to walk up all the main creeks and. Look at each boulder. Now, each boulder may not move again uh, because some of them are part of older debris flows that are nearly cemented to the base of the channel. Others are young and falling in. I saw some landslides since the event already moving boulders into the channel. So it just depends how many there are. And this map is probably the best one. And this was produced at various stages uh, where now they're recommending evacuation. Um, we have mandatory. Free evacuation, recommended and mandatory. And the idea there is you just, you know, if you just advise people to go, they probably may not go, you know. But uh, if you, we're working on presenting a little video. It'll probably be a cartoon because we don't have pictures of this event. About 30 seconds, it shows a house being torn off a foundation and moved down the canyon or flooded with mud. That will go out with the warnings. So people don't know what's likely to, I mean, it's a big difference between a flash flood, which most people have probably experienced, and, uh, and a debris flow and a mud flow. They're entirely different processes, and the hazards are much greater. So, so that's something we need to do in terms of warning people a little better. But there's large areas in here where the faults are that are probably safe. And, uh, and people, some of the schools and stuff that didn't get flooded, they've asked us, you know, given their elevation and so forth, what should they do? Are they safe or not? It's a sometimes a difficult call, particularly in the lower parts, where these things have more of a tendency to fan out, so to speak. So this is based on the January 9 uh, flow. But again, remember, this whole area is debris flow deposit. So what do we learn? <clears throat> Well, obviously, the mandatory evacuation should include the entire potential debris flow path. That's been done. We know that now. From the mountains to the sea, as Humpty used to say down in L.A. at a newscast when I grew up in Glendale, from the mountains to the sea, I report. Well, that's what we're talking about, from the mountains to the sea. And uh, need more education of the public about debris flows. Lots of people working on that. We need to improve the science of debris flow and fire recurrence and how climate change is likely to change the odds of these kinds of things. What's the intensity of fire, you know, of wildfires, their frequency, and, uh, and these intense precipitation events. Maybe we'll see, unfortunately, more of these things lining up. But you still have to accumulate the boulders, OK? So that's a little bit of our protection there. Uh, this just shows a house surrounded by mud. I've been up there a bunch of times. Some of the houses were torn off foundations. And they were mostly ones that were really right next to the creek, where these spreading out and the big boulders moved through. And that was probably instantaneous mass destruction of their home. 
on the fringes, uh, we're mapping uh, lots of things like debris flow uh, mud lines, which is often two or three to six feet higher than the rocks and on the edges, which tells you the mud got up there and then went down like a flash flood would, but probably much more viscous and can, of course, destroy. And if you get three feet of mud in your house, it's a, it's a very bad situation. Down there, the freeway, uh, mostly fine stuff. I didn't see a lot of boulders there. Uh, probably some, but not very many. So I think that's kind of the wet end of the thing, rather, as opposed to the wet tail. When you look at older debris flow deposits like Rocky Nook Park, you see piles of boulders. But there's no sediment between them. The fines are gone. So either they wrote it out, which I doubt, or when the flow stops, they drain out. And that can contribute to the mud flows, as well as the wet tail that can go up and over the flow and produce these higher mud lines. All this is happening in minutes. You know, so it's not like you, know, uh, you have a lot of time. So we never want to see 101 closed again from these kinds of things. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll give you some suggestions that I've dealt with with flash flooding. And as we move forward, we can discuss some of these. I gave a talk at the, at the emergency meeting the other day, and I suggest just raising some of the houses. Nobody wants to raise their houses. They're trying to hide their houses for the most part. So, so that seemed to be not a, a, not a very good option. But also, the, the pilings could be broken. But if they're in the mud flow part and you're five feet up, the flow could pass underneath like we do for hurricane surges and things like that. Well, you, this is the mud line. Okay? This is boulders out here. On the edge is mostly mud. House is still standing, so big boulders didn't go raging through it. But the mud got up four or five feet. And uh, so what do you do about that? We have a lot of work with dealing with flash floods and the Houston floods and other floods in an area called flood proofing. Okay? And flood proofing is, you can find it downtown in the old El Estero where people you know, have storm doors that cover their openings and windows that are higher and things like that. But around the country, what people can do, for example, down, at, down here in Montecito Village, if they had a little wall out here, and I'm not talking about any ugly wall, I'm talking about a nice wavy wall with pots on and tables behind, uh, you could have avoided all of that for spending not that much money. Because you can see the mud just got up to there, but it was enough to get in some of the places and caused a big problem. So flood proofing, I'm kind of becoming a fan of where it's appropriate, some sorts of wall system. By the way, we need one at the airport around our terminal in case we ever do get a tsunami or some sort of flood in there. They're very inexpensive. Houston had this big flood last year. Did you hear about that? 50 inches of rain in a week. Now, that's a lot of rain or in four days. And, uh, and they had flooding in areas hadn't flooded in 500 years. The medical center, worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, spent about $10 million and didn't flood at all. They built a wall around the whole thing. And you can see the air photos where everything's flooded around them and they're fine. They may have to get to work on a boat. I don't know about that. But, but, they, but their whole center was, was saved. And it's a nice looking wall. Walls don't need to be ugly. I'm not a great fan of walls. But some places, you know, this, this may be a potential solution. There's a guy, fireman, wading through uh, one of the muddier places. This is just a construction of a flood wall. I, I've tried to find some off the web. You need to have them designed by engineers. We'd have to work out, you know, what will be the, the stresses on the walls. You're not talking about a wall blocking the flow. You're talking about deflecting and keeping it parallel to the valley. And this is something that property owners can and probably should do if they're going to rebuild in this marginal area where this is likely. And you're probably going to need a wall around the whole place <laughs> because, again, of the, of the unsteady flow pass. If the flow path changes, it may come from the other direction. But these don't have to be ugly walls. This, I don't like this gate, but the wall's OK. Uh, that can protect places. They can be, this is too low, but you kind of get the idea. OK, so, so, uh, so maybe in our planning processes in some places that have flash flood hazards and debris flow hazards, we could add in, you know, you're going to build a house. One of my friends who live in Montecito, who my daughter had $13 million of damage, and the house wasn't destroyed. And it was just mud. And their front 
that came through their front gate, knocked off the gate and came in. But had they had a good gate there, maybe it could have been avoided. Um, <clears throat> then you say, well, we can talk about this, but if I build a wall, am I going to increase the danger to my neighbors? Maybe. Because uh, you aren't going to get the mud, and there's going to be more mud maybe going down. But maybe we need to analyze these places block by block and decide where this is more appropriate than other places. And, uh, and then provide some guidance. If you're going to build a house and put $20 million in it, why not put a, couple, a million dollars in a wall and protect it or something? That, that just makes sense to me, but you know. Anyway, I, I'm going to stop there and we can talk about this, but that's a planning thing. It's kind of like, I, I consider this part of designing with nature because we know what nature's going to do, okay? And we can predict the places where, the, where these kind of muddy flows are going to go. You can't protect yourself against a boulder field coming down. If you're in that part of the panel, it's just, it's just going to destroy the house. And we shouldn't rebuild in those places, probably, for flash flooding or debris flows. But on the margins, when I get down near Olive Mill and some of the other roads, you mainly just see these mud lines. You know, you don't see massive destruction of the houses. Or maybe if you put a community wall in, not right on the stream banks, but back from it a bit, beyond the street, that could protect little areas, okay? Uh, from just flat, not only mud flows, but also uh, flash flooding. Bearing in mind, if you get the, the really big debris flow, even much bigger than this one, like what happened at Rocky Nook, you may be in trouble. But those, the bigger you get, the rarer it is. And so there's a relationship between that. And, and um, Rocky Nook flow is much bigger than Montecito, I believe, but I can't tell you that yet. Uh, but in terms of volume and so forth. Uh, but this was plenty big. But it's probably, it may not be the biggest one we can expect out of some of these basins. Although my guess is we won't, the chances of seeing this again in the next year or two are pretty slim unless we get these really high intensive rainfall, which is relatively rare. And we still don't know how many boulders are sitting up there. There could be 500 or 5 million. And everybody has their own answer, and the only way to answer that is go up and count them. Okay? So that's kind of what we're doing, because that's the ammunition that drives the, the part of the flow that's most destructive. So, but that's a science question, but it has bearing on, on planning and so forth. If the return period of these things is really hundreds or a couple thousand years, that may affect some of the things that, that we do. And if we know more about these flows, I'm still working in my mind, and we don't have all the data, we've taken hundreds of samples and stuff, how the mud gets in the boulders, how it organizes, moves it, why it stops. We think it just runs out of energy and friction, even though it's moving very fast, and then can stop fairly quick at a front, and the big boulders are left, and then the mud flows over it. That can spread out to the sides and flood homes with mud or flood 101. Anyway, that's, that's where I'm at with this thing now. And in two years, I'll give you a much better talk. <laughs> yeah? How much? We're just getting the flood control LIDAR post-event. Post, uh, we have 1990 topography at a, about a two and a half foot control on it. There's a 2006 LIDAR I'm trying to get. It was Penfield. Uh, contracted it, I think, for the Montecito Water District. You guys know how to get that. I'd love to get it. I've been trying to call them. What we need to do is you take the 2006 LIDAR, which is good to a few centimeters. You don't need that out boulders. And you, and you make the surface. Then you take the, the, the 2009 after the flood, and you difference it. And, that, and that'll tell you that. That'll be a volume. I guarantee it got bigger. In the mountains, it may have got smaller because we cleared out the channel. So I expect to see. We think there's six or eight feet of scour up in the mountain parts where these boulders came from, and six or eight feet of deposition down below. But whether that was a million cubic meters, or two, or five, I doubt if it's 10. That was Rocky Nook. Could be, though. We don't know. So uh, that's the answer to your question. We're working on that. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, are you looking at When I looked at that, they were a very small percentage of the water, even in the rainfall. 
you assume a lot of it ran off. I mean, just a few percent. I, I can't, in my own mind, see that made much of a difference. And anyway, it came down the channels probably, and it wasn't generated on the slopes, so which would make the mud and the flow. So my own personal, having not having studied it, is that the volume's pretty low compared to the volume of rainfall and runoff. Yeah. No, no, to answer your question, they, they, they're not. And the reason for that is just based on what was damaged in this flow. So if the flow's bigger, it would spread out more. But in that lower part of the fan, it can go anywhere on the fan. So if you're down below Casa Dorinda and you're in the muddy part of this thing, uh, then I think most homes anywhere near those creeks, unless you're up 25, 30 feet in elevation, should consider doing something to protect their property. Because the next flow may not even go down that channel. It may move over there. At the freeway, I've, engineers have to deal with this problem, but it seems like a wall, deflective wall, that would deflect the mud through an area big enough to pass it under the freeway would, would really help. Because it obviously changed position, the stream channels, and as a result, uh, we ended up with a flooded freeway in the low spots. And it costs more money to do that, but how much did it cost to close the freeway all those days? And the, not counting inconvenience. These fair weather crossings, I call them, the freeways, is not a great idea. We have another one, the Ventura River, just a fair weather crossing. It closes every few years. So I think, you know, it all has to do with infrastructure. And if you think it's worth it for a process that may not occur again in a few hundred, for a few hundred years. But we do those sorts of things routinely for earthquakes, don't we? And we require people to seismic refit. We require, because we know uh, we're likely to see magnitude 7 earthquake here one day, certainly on the San Andreas. And so we know if we don't do anything like they've done in some countries of the world, we could have 50, 60, 100,000 deaths. We look a few hundred because we have these rules. Now, this is a similar process in terms of time framework. But, a, but, but over a, a more restricted area. It doesn't really actually end, but no, I don't think you can rely on those exactly. <clears throat> um, well, when you're right up in the canyon, everything's going to come out of the canyon, of any one basin. Then it can spread out. I, my guess is the probability of spreading out increases as you go down the fan. You're more likely to hit the bridges, the, the curves. Uh, but if you look at a fan, okay, you know the Spanish fans? They're built like this. So they, they start up here. They can go anywhere. They have to go all over it to make a fan. The only thing that seems to stop them in Montecito is uh, these fault scarps. And that, that brings up earthquake hazard, and we're studying that too. But that's the Mission Ridge Fault, continuation of the one that folded over your ridge. <laughs> so, and that's a pretty active fault. We actually have a site at the Brimwood Golf Course we trenched a few years ago. And we're going to submit a radiocarbon date. We'll know when that earthquake occurred. We think it was in the last. 10,000 years. Most people don't say, oh, that's so long, but I don't need to deal with it. But, uh, but we don't know. It could be a few hundred, but I think it's a few. But we don't know. That's about science, you know. You, we, we're not in the game of guessing, okay? So when, when you talk to a scientist, and some people don't understand this, that we demand numbers and dates and, and data to back up what we say. Now, sometimes it's good to get advice from people. I'm giving you advice, and I don't have any data yet. <laughs> But, but we're trying to get it, you know what I mean? I wouldn't say how much stuff is up in those canyons and whether it could produce a debris flow or not. I can tell you that the storm we need is going to be a pretty intense one to get it, which tells me it's fairly rare. It's not going to burn again, <laughs> okay? For, and we're, we're stuck in this window of two to five years of when there's increased risk from debris. And so it's, not a, it's a sobering thing. On the other hand, uh, like I said, you're looking at something that hasn't occurred in Santa Barbara in 100, over, over 1,000 years. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I know they've happened in lots of places. I've seen some pictures in South America of whole cities, big high rises, all the streets covered in big boulders. My guess is, again, they're rare there as well, and probably 
not as much. There's places, I think, in Switzerland and a few other places in the Alps that frequently had. L.A., Los Angeles has lots of these. They have 15 or so. And the last one was 1943, the big one, in New Year's Day in, in uh, La Crescenta. Anybody here from La Crescenta? That's where I grew up. Anyway, um, right a couple years after I was born, they, they, in 43, they had an event that killed 41 people that came out of a small canyon after it burned. Since then, there's been probably 10 or 15 debris flows that have killed 5, 10, 15, 20 people in L.A. It's a bigger area. And they've responded with debris basins on one hand, which is a good thing to do, by the way. Flood control is on the right track with that. Uh, the Santa Monica debris basin evidently really helped, you know, Carpinteria. The problem is that most of those canyons are small, and you can't get enough area, okay, in these debris basins, that, so they overtop them. <coughs> But it's a help in smaller ones. Uh, I've read, done some reading on some other types of things they use in Switzerland and places. They're big metal steel rings about this big around their chain link together like the old guys who joust were only much bigger. And they put them across the basin about 15 feet high and all the rocks pile up against it and the water drains out. And you go afterwards and clean it out. You make five or six in a row and you can uh, get more debris trapped in a basin maybe in some cases. They, I was told they use some of these up in our national forest. And they're probably less expensive than building a big dam. And, uh, and, and they seem to work. That's something to, to look into. And I talked to Tom Favor a bit about that, too. Tom's a, one of my former students. I ran into a lot of my old students during this thing. Uh, he took my courses years ago. Because <laughs> I've been teaching 50 years almost, so it's not surprising. But... Um, so there's more, there are other options, trap the debris or plan. <laughs> I, I think a combination is best. It'd be really nice if you could trap some of those big boulders before they ended up down on the Piedmont, you know, destroying homes. I think it's possible. Most of our debris bracers are just too small to handle these flows. And I think Tom told me at San Ysidro Creek, the flow went 50 feet over the dam. So, but if you had a series of these things upstream, maybe you'd have caught enough of them. It wouldn't. But I think some of that was this, that the, I don't really know the situation. Talk to Tom. He's really good, by the way. You're lucky to have him. That these basins uh, can plug up, and the drains can, come, can plug up. And they worked feverishly after this event to make sure that things are relatively good. Jeff, and they do before. They, they're very conscious of this. Any other questions? Got you all scared to death? <laughs> well, I think you have an important responsibility, you and the architects and the engineers, uh, to come up with something that'll work. There are definite areas where I think flood proofing is an option. And there are definite areas upstream where we could trap more debris. And those things uh, can be done. And, 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 and they should if you want to deal with, with these kind of rare big events. And, uh, but we got lots of streams along Santa Barbara. You know that one that crosses. Uh, you take 292 down, you go past uh, Rattlesnake Creek, and the next big bridge where the San Roque area that maybe has the Royal Burrow Creek. Look down in there next time you're there, the whole wall's a debris flow, the whole wall of the canyon. And uh, so they've come down there. The big alluvial fan coming out of, was it 154 that comes out of the mountains up there from Kachuma? If you look in the lower part, that's a huge fan with debris flows on it. So the only place I don't see these very much Goleta, for some reason, parts of Goleta have really nice streams with floodplains, which I love. And they have floodplain management, and they've kept people off the floodplains. They're pretty protected. You want to see the biggest boulders I've ever seen, though, and I, don't, I haven't looked at this hazard in years, go up to the Trout Club sometime and look at the pools up there. So, massive, massive size boulders. Uh, they didn't, I don't know if they're a debris flow or not, but some of them may be. I'm running out of time, though. Any more questions? I, I think there's a, I told you I got an email today about some group, it may have been the architects are putting together a tour of this area in our people. I'll send you a, Mike, some of you might be interested in seeing that. Uh, by then, uh, probably most of the mud lines will be gone. Well, I'm in real trouble with these mud lines. I'm tired of mud lines. I can see them on the houses, they're very clear and sharp. When you get out on the trees, it'll be this high on one side of the tree and six feet higher on the other. Where do you pick it? Because the stuff's coming down and whooshing up. Because they're blocking the flow. 
whereas along the sides, the houses flow just the house is the wall, <laughs> right? And at the and at the wall held didn't have windows and doors and things. Uh, those houses probably wouldn't have had all that mud in it. You're welcome. But remember, we have a lot to be proud of. Our our people who worked on this thing deserve a great deal of credit. You guys, everybody who worked.